For much of this course, Italy has really been the epicenter of art. But in the early 20th century, many young Italians felt that Italy was a political, economic, and artistic backwater. Far from reveling in Italy's past greatness, these self-described futurists deplored what they described as Italy's museum mentality. Their god was motion and even more speed. Uh, as founder Filippo Marinetti put it, and this quotation is in your textbook, a speeding automobile is more beautiful than the Nike of Samothrace. More disturbingly, actually that's pretty disturbing in and of itself, a futurist artist glorified war. There was actually a lot of this in the intellectual era of pre-World War I Europe. Social Darwinists, for example, believed that nations like species obeyed the law of the survival of the fittest, and many held that the white race was demonstrably fitter than everyone else, and that a little war from time to time showed who, who was on top. Nietzsche's emphasis on passion, on overcoming, on the will to power, this translated for many into a kind of worship of violence and conquest. Some historians believe, and I actually share this belief, uh, that these attitudes contributed to Europeans' willingness to get into a pretty stupid war, really be swept into it, and to the initial enthusiasm for that war. Even in the years after World War II, there were leaders in Europe, people in Europe, who would extol the virtues of wartime, unity, and courage and of nationalistic violence, and this theme would attract many World War I veterans to fascism. I'm not going to read the Futurist Manifesto out loud or these excerpts, but I would encourage you to check out uh, the overheated, violent, and provocative rhetoric for yourself, because it gives a real insight into the mind view, not just of these artists, but of the people who helped lead us into two world wars. Note that women are identified as the enemy. That's actually a common and disturbing theme, to my mind, in modernist art, uh, influenced in large part by the writings of Sigmund Freud. Did you watch Sister Wendy's take on Picasso's women? It's worth doing. And here is the futurist's homage to the machine. Again, some overheated prose for you to read on your own. This is one of Futurism's most famous images, although I frankly think it's a pretty silly painting. You should be aware that the College Board loves to include at least one general multiple-choice question about Futurism, and the correct answer is almost always something to do with motion or speed. Here are some more speeding objects in motion by the same artist. Uh, here's a slide from our last unit. Remember those galloping horses? Futurists, and indeed many modernist artists, were heavily influenced by Mybridge's photographs capturing motion. So here's another set. Uh, the same theme of bodies in motion. Sorry, I'm going through pages quickly here. Now, I do not find this cast bronze sculpture silly, and it's one of the most influential sculptures of the 20th century. So you can see here the futurist worship of the machine and of speed, movement, uh, but you should also see the influence of cubist art uh, and it's in the exploration of multiple surface planes and volumetric shapes. Uh, this is a sculpture you need to know, by the way. Many of the futurists in, uh, volunteered to fight in World War I, and Baccioni was actually killed in battle. After the war, many would join Mussolini's fascist movement. Severini was another founding member of the Futurist Movement and a signatory of that manifesto you just saw. Uh, I've mentioned the Futurist glorification of war. This painting produces what your textbook, I think, appropriately calls a sanitized vision of an armored train complete with sleek cannons and highly stylized machine-like troops bearing rifles. There is n no blood and gore in this painting, and the colors are disconcertingly bright and cheerful. Okay, now we get to one of the weirdest and most fun, frankly, episodes in art history, the Dada movement. I'm going to introduce it with the first few minutes of a video that captures some of Dada's frenetic and playful spirit and its anti-establishment in your face attitude, literature and art. Uh, the entire 27-minute video, video, which is called the ABCs of Dada, and appropriately enough for Dada starts with Z for Zurich and moves backward, uh, will be on Moodle in three parts in case you want to check it out. Uh, we just heard from Hans Arp in the video, In the Dada Spirit, he believed that chance should determine his composition. So he cut up pieces of paper, dropped them onto another sheet of paper on the floor, and glued the art that resulted. 
A Dada artist also adapted the collage method that we've just seen in Cubism uh, to make political statements with photos. Here's another video clip about photo montage, which includes footage of this artage, artist as an elderly woman still playing with her Dada dolls. Now that you've seen the video clip, I hope, and have some sense of photo montage, take a closer look at this work. Hawk has included images of her political heroes, Marx and Lenin, uh, as well as a map showing where women can vote. She also stuck the heads of German military leaders on exotic dancers' bodies. Here I've uh, blown up, snipped and blown up clips of those images. I think they're kind of fun. So what's Meritz? A Meritz was actually a syllable from the word Kommersbank, or commercial bank, uh, which showed up in one of the articles. In other words, in the Dada spirit, it is entirely made up, accidental, and nonsensical, and it's a term that they use for all sorts of collages. But by far the most famous Dada artist was Marcel Duchamp. Believe it or not, the fountain, and yes, it is just a urinal turned on it, turned upside down, uh, it competes with Demoiselle d'Avignon for the title of the most influential artwork of the 20th century. I'm not kidding. Uh, the urinal was one of a group of sculptures that Duchamp gave the name Ready Made. Uh, you need to know that term, by the way. Uh, the bicycle wheel on the, uh, wheel on the stool is another very famous example. You have to know the story of the fountain, but you already heard it on the Khan Academy podcast, right? I hope. Um, the fountain and other ready mades appear on the AP exam frequently. Here's a 2011 example. Um, and the video, uh, the video clip will tell you how Marcel Duchamp sort of answered that question. This is a 1965 interview uh, that he gave with an art museum curator. And then I'll show you what the college board says. I'm not going to read this, but I hope you will. Uh, what's amazing about this work, and hard to tell from the slide, is that it's made up of oil paint, wire, and lead foil placed between two large panels of glass. So the bride on top, according to Duchamp himself, was basically a motor fueled by love gasoline. Okay? Uh, it's a little easier to make out male figures in the bottom. The chocolate grinder apparently represents masturbation. I am not making this up, by the way, and neither is your textbook. Duchamp left a whole book of detailed notes about this work. You can find more information on the Internet if you're interested. Now, this Duchamp painting of movement shows a kinship with cubism, with futurism, and also with Mybridge's motion photography. In fact, it may have been based in part on another Mybridge study, this time an early movie. If you Google the name of this painting and then go to the Wikipedia site that comes up, uh, you can see the actual film footage of a nude woman descending a staircase. The Salon des Indépendants, where many of the artists we've been studying in this unit introduced their work to the world, and which the AP uh, exam might just want you to know, uh, rejected this painting when it was submitted to their exhibition of Cubist art. Uh, the jury thought the title was too literary, uh, and the painting was too close to futurism. There may have been a political motive to this decision. The futurists were seen as right-wing, and indeed many become fascists. I mean, I, right-wing is a somewhat odd characteristic of the fascists at this point, because many of them were socialists of a sort. A nationalist socialist term uh, for Nazis was not actually completely a misnomer, but that's a subject for another class. Uh, at any rate, the Parisian art scene was the, for the most part committed to socialism or even communism, so the futurists were viewed as politically incorrect. Uh, this painting generated a firestorm of criticism when it first appeared in the famous 1913 Armory Show in New York City. That, by the way, is one of the most important ex exhibitions in our history. You need to know that name. In fact, I was surprised at how many questions there are in general about the various places where art is exhibited. The Armory Show introduced American audiences to European artists such as Picasso, Matisse, Brock, Kirchner, Kandinsky, and of course Duchamp. It also featured some notable American artists. So here's a photo of the show being set up at the Armory of the New York National Guard 69th uh, Regiment. I don't really have time for this, but I can't resist uh, sharing a fun anecdote about this show and the Duchamp painting you just saw. This is another tidbit I picked up from Wikipedia.
So after attending the Armory Show and seeing Marcel Duchamp's nude, President Theodore Roosevelt wrote, and this is an exact quote, Take the picture, which for some reason is called a naked man going downstairs. Not quite correct there. There is in my bathroom a really good Navajo rug, which, on any proper interpretation of Cuba's theory, is a far more satisfactory and decorative picture. Now, if for some unscrutable reason, it suited somebody to call this rug a picture of, say, a well-dressed man going up a ladder, the name would fit the facts just as well as in the case of the Cubist picture of the naked man going downstairs. Uh, from the standpoint of terminology, each name would have whatever merit inheres in a rather cheap, straining-after effect. And from the standpoint of decorative value, of sincerity, and of artistic merit, the Navajo rug is infinitely ahead of the picture. And now you have President Roosevelt's word on art. Uh, and it's a nice segue into the final topic for this lecture, which is early 20th century American art. In the last unit, we saw paintings by landscape, uh, saw the landscapes of the Hudson River School and portraits, landscapes, and genre scenes by American realists and impressionists, such as Sargent and Whistler. So America was joining the art world. It would achieve much greater importance after World War II, when New York City replaced Paris as the epicenter of modern art. This rather gritty painting of a drunk woman and two disapproving middle-class onlookers on a New York City street is an example of the Ashcan School. Uh, these were realist painters who had a political as well as an artistic motive. They wanted Americans to confront poverty and then do something about it. Here are another couple of Ashcan School paintings, both of New York's Lower East Side, where many immigrants settled. I really like the title of this work. Uh, and here are some Dada-esque works by Man Ray, who would be a leading figure in the post-war New York art renaissance. More in-your-face art with ready-mades. This artist was influenced by both Cubism and Kandinsky's abstract art. Interestingly, it's not an anti-war painting, but rather a tribute to a friend of the artist, a German officer, who was killed in the early days of World War I, just before this was done. Aaron Douglas uh, was a Harlem Renaissance artist. You need to know the Harlem Renaissance, which was a flowering of music, art, literature by African-American artists in New York in the 1920s. Uh, Douglas illustrated a series of poems entitled God's Trombones by poet and composer James Weldon Johnson, who's another major Harlem Renaissance figure. He's also one of my favorite composers, uh, modern composers. Those of you who visited Palo Alto were hearing a piece by James Weldon Johnson, I think, uh, as you arrived. At any rate, this three-minute YouTube video, uh, which we're not going to hear in class, combines a recording of his most famous piece along with Harlem Renaissance art images. I think it's very cool, and if you're interested, check it out on Moodle. Oh, sigh, another ism. This one made in America. Like futurists, precisionists were fascinated by machines. They also adopted some of the disassemble and reassemble strategies associated with synthetic cubism. I was a little startled to see Georgia O'Keeffe under the precisionism heading. I guess, though, that this painting does reveal a fascination with the busy life of New York City, where she'd moved in 1918 from the thriving metropolis of Canyon, Texas. But what Georgia O'Keeffe is really famous for, her paintings of the Southwest, uh, she began spending part of her year there in 1929, and a lot of her most famous paintings are of that region. But what are even more famous are her detailed close-ups of flowers. This is from her Hawaiian period. She was actually commissioned to do a series of paintings in Hawaii. Uh, here's another uh, flower painting. By the way, there is a huge debate over whether O'Keeffe's paintings were, in fact, erotic, thinly dis disguised renditions of female genitalia uh, masquerading as plant genitalia. Well, in 1943, O'Keeffe, uh, sick and tired of all these suggestions, finally replied, I quote, Well, I made you take time to look at what I saw, and when you took time to really notice my flowers, you hung all your own associations with flowers on my flower, and you write about my flower as if I think and see what you think and see of the flower. I don't. A lot of people are not convinced. Uh, if you Google Georgia O'Keeffe, most of what you're going to get is back and forth on whether or not her paintings are, in fact, erotic art. Feel free to check it out. 
Georgia O'Keeffe was first discovered by and later married to the most prominent American photographer of the early 20th century, Alfred Stiglitz. This is probably his most famous photograph, and it has appeared in the past on AP exams. Stiglitz rebelled against what he saw as art photography. He believed in straight, unmanipulated photographs that captured some important aspect of real life in the world around him. In some ways, he was kind of an impressionist, you know, trying to capture the moment and a moment that means something about the world world. Uh, here's another famous example. I love the way this photo captures the dust thrown up by the horse's hooves. And here is one of his relatively few PG-rated photos of his wife, Georgia O'Keeffe. And finally, this is an example of art photography that shows the influence of abstract art. Uh, it really takes some staring to figure out what body parts you're seeing. At first glance, you think one thing, look more closely, and you'll see something else. I'm going to break here. Oops, I did not mean to skip ahead of that. Sorry about that. There we go. Uh, in my next lecture, I'll look at how artists responded to the Russian Revolution, the rise of fascism in World War II, and at the Freud-inspired world of the surrealists.